Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 2, Episode 15, titled Little Miss Dangerous. And and with the crayon drawings, they really mean little. <laughs> <laughs> it originally premiered on January 31st, 1986. It was written by Frank Military. We remember he appeared in the episode Nobody Lives Forever. He's... I forget his name, but he's one of those kids that squirts ketchups on ketchup on seats and stuff like that. <laughs> he's the ketchup squirter. That's what we just call him. That. Hey, uh, what, what date was this released on? January thirty first. January thirty first. Finally, I was born. <laughs> <laughs> the director. This is the first week in which I was actually born. This is the first episode. You actually exist now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which means the challenger just exploded. <laughs> that was in week in vice uh came out on wednesday i talked about the challenger yeah i had nothing to do with it the, way. <laughs> the director was leon ichasso ichasso uh he's gonna direct a I, bunch of episodes in the future this was his first one but he's got like 10 more coming really because i get the feeling he wants to be a music video director like that's his real passion <laughs> Before we get started, like chicken and see what's going on in each other's lives and guys, trending this week on Twitter was a hashtag for 80s bucket list. So we do a podcast about a fantastic 80s show starring some of the biggest stars of the 80s, especially for TV. And I think we can go around and talk about, you know, we're, we're, we're from the 80s. We can talk about things that we wish that would have happened while we were at, or things that maybe we wish we would have been able to complete in the 80s. And I would say, for me, if I'm looking back from my childhood and, and remembering the 80s, like, I wish Alf would have stayed. I want <laughs> Alf forever. I know. Don't leave. <laughs> Keep feeding them cats. It's hey, okay. He never ate any cat. <laughs> <laughs> he ate, like, a substitute cat or something. <laughs> do, do you think that if he stayed, we'd have an Alf reboot by now? Oh, God, I can't even imagine what an Alf reboot would look like right now. It wouldn't you know, be someone in a costume, right? Yeah, that's exactly. It would be, like, CGI or something. You know, I like the Alf cartoon better. That oh. was, like, my favorite. I mean, not better, <laughs> but I loved it on Saturday mornings to watch the Alf cartoon when he was on yeah. Melmac. Mm-hmm. Like, it was, like, what he was like in his home planet. So I love that. <laughs> That best. <laughs> As a comic book fan, I always felt like Alf was just an extension of Howard the Duck. Oh, I wish he was as foul mouthed as Howard the Duck. <laughs> that would be even better. Uh, Alf uh, smoking cigarettes, gambling. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, as I indicated a moment ago, I was born in 86, and so I was only four years old when the 80s ended. Most of what I know about the 80s, I know through syndication. So I guess for me, if I could go back, it would be to go back to try and watch, go back and be around during some of that iconic stuff. Because, like, right now, you know, I was technically alive when the Berlin Wall fell, but mm. I wasn't exactly, I'm not exactly alive to give a a uh, state uh, we're old enough to give a statement on it you know <laughs> well i know i'm old enough and i don't really have a statement about it what does that say <laughs> <laughs> well most say you don't are care about world events <laughs> <laughs> we'll say you have the most memories from the 80s oh like, i get it working I'm the around oldest. here trying to not try not to say that you're old <laughs> yes, I'm old. Yep, I know. I remember all the stuff about the '80s, and, and I, I want to go back and not and not watch the Transformer movies in the theater <laughs> <laughs> because my world was crushed. Oh crushed come on, with... come on, Melissa. No, Rodimus crushed. Prime is a is <gasps> he's a a worthy Prime. Oh, I thought you were going to say he was better. I was going to go <laughs> find you and kick you. <laughs> <laughs> Rodimus is a hack. I said it. Hot Rod is a hack. He could never cut it as a prime. That's why they had to they had to bring Optimus Prime back from the dead to revive the show because Hot Rod was a hack. <laughs> you, you heard it here first, folks. The, the the hottest takes always coming from the Vice Cast. <laughs> I thought for sure, Melissa. I know you're you're such a huge fan of the Transformers, but I thought for sure it would have been something Days of Our Lives related. Like Hope and Bo's wedding? <laughs> yes. Or um, when John Black, see that was in the 90s though, when John Black, when you discovered he wasn't really Roman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> can, or when, can, can I ask you something, Melissa? Wh- yeah. Which one's Jennifer Aniston's parents? Oh, um, 
De Stefano. So the bad guy, the yeah, old. It is him. It is yeah, the bad guy. Dad, that... Yeah, yeah. He just died, I okay. think, recently. But yeah, De Stefano. We yeah, that was her dad. Well, once again. We have to bow down to Melissa's TV knowledge <laughs> from the 80s and early 90s. <laughs> hey, I, I thought that was, was a pretty TV. good poll for me with the Jennifer Aniston connection. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, your mom, you guys' mom watched the Days of Our Lives more than I did. So you guys probably know just as much as I do about it. My mom and attention. my grandmother. I have. Uh, in, in fact, our grandmother, who I used to spend summers with. Make you watch it over the summer, huh? <laughs> we, we, she wouldn't just watch one. She watched all of them. <laughs> As the World Turns, The Bold and the Beautiful. So I am fam- I am way too familiar with soap opera plots from the 90s. <laughs> I have no comment about my knowledge on Young and the Rest of the Storylines. All I'll say is... That's how I imagine the world is in my head, and I fill in your backstory using <laughs> Young uh, and the Restless. <laughs> young and the I used Restless to watch the Young and the Restless. Hey, it has Shamar Moore on it. That's where Shamar Moore came from. I know all about Young exactly. and the Restless. Exactly. Exactly. I may have watched that show. Young and the Restless and Soul Train. Yeah, only for him I may have watched that show. (laughs) Let's go over and talk about this episode of Miami Vice because although this isn't a soap opera storyline, pretty much every late 90s and 2000s cop show is pretty much this story. Serial killer, who's the one that you least expect. So let's, uh, let's go over and talk about this episode. So we open up. At Sex World. And right out of the <laughs> gate, I have a question. Is prostitution actually illegal in Miami? Because looking around, it doesn't seem like it. When this scene started, I thought at first, like, oh, they're at a strip club. And then as the scene continued on, I was like, no, they're at a sex club. I thought for sure it was going to be a live sex club. Like, they were just going to watch two people have yeah, sex. Yeah, you asked me, stage. you're like, is, is this going to be like a live sex show? Cause is that okay? I'm like, no, it's just like a strip <laughs> show where they just have some weird, I don't know, no I, one actually I was strips. waiting for the donkey to come out. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was interesting that they were panning through the crowd and they show all the guys like, oh yeah, oh, that's hot. And then like, there's like one guy shaking in the corner like, um, did, did they just show a guy masturbating? <laughs> <laughs> when it first started, I, I swear, I thought, I thought she was a stripper and then I thought, man, she doesn't dance very well I'm like she's a terrible stripper <laughs> and then all of a sudden the guy appeared and i was like wait a minute where's this going <laughs> i'm gonna settle in for the long haul on this one can we yeah. just like, like i don't find that i don't understand why anyone would want to watch that like i don't get it because no they're you're right there's no sex and there's no stripping so what is the point like you're just watching like an erotic play know. or something is that what the, it's like <laughs> i don't get it well they didn't even get they didn't even get naked, no, so right? I mean, they don't. I mean, I understand yeah. Miami Vice, so they can't really get naked. But you can imagine in the eighties when that came out, uh, nineteen eighty six, how much of a like a scandal that that episode was because it was scandalous. Like, oh my god, they're gonna they're showing like live sex and strippers, and I remember that. Like that that episode specifically was why I was not supposed to watch the show, but I did anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, Melissa, ever since you said naked play, all I can think is I would probably go see a naked version of Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Make it more interesting. I don't see that. I don't see that. <laughs> After this stage performance, we're backstage, and it's like the performance is more like an interpret an interpretation in dance yeah, exactly. of what sex would be. <laughs> and backstage, she's talking to the guy that she was dancing with, and she's saying that she has someone's going to pay her ninety dollars for sex. And he says, "But you're not a whore." And, and my thought is like, "But I, th- I think she is." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Way to judge. Well, and, and sure she is. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I, I thought it was hilarious when he tells her, you're not a whore. You're an actress. I'm like, yeah, to you. <laughs> uh, you know, but by the end of the open, you know, I think he's right. She is an actress. She puts on a pretty good uh, act the entire time. And luckily, Sonny was able to figure it out at the last minute. <laughs> by the way, the name, the name of the club, Sex World, I mean, could they not come up with a more obvious name? Like, can we not be cool about this? Let's not beat around the bush about this. This is Sex World. <laughs> we don't actually is, have sex, though. <laughs> if I go to a place called Sex World, I expect it to be a place that sells dild- with dildos on the wall. and <laughs> That's the Dildo Emporium. That's down the street. Okay. The left. <laughs> okay. 
she says that she's still going to go sleep with this guy no matter what. And so Kat says, like, you're going you're to go no matter what I say. She's kind of asking his permission, but she doesn't need it. She goes outside, meets up with the sailor. They go to the hotel directly across the street. Meanwhile, Kat waits outside on the street because he knows what's going to happen in there. He knows that not only are they going to have sex, but exactly what she does, where in the middle of sex, she grabs an open knife just sitting on the end table. What were they doing beforehand? What kind of foreplay were they doing before we come in and see that when she grabs the knife and then stabs him repeatedly in the I back? I think they were trying to say that sailors are not very observant. That guy was not paying attention. <laughs> that was just on the counter right there just waiting, and he was like, whatever. Are we sure he's a sailor? <laughs> Maybe he's just a village person enthusiast. Yeah. I didn't know they had – I didn't know their uniforms were really like that. I thought that was like a Popeye uniform or something. The worst fleet week <laughs> ever. I think they make the seamen wear those. <laughs> yeah, I'm going there. So <laughs> so after a few minutes, Cat gets tired of waiting. He just goes over to the hotel and, and he opens up the door. He sees the dead body. He sees she had lit some things on fire and she's in the corner holding the knife. And you just see this look of disappointment on his face. Not, no shock, no surprise. No, like, I got to run out and try and help this guy. No, he just walks no, what over he's to her. Thinking is, I hope her. he paid her first. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you got red, man. The camera pans past the fire and it shows like a crayon, hand drawn crayon drawing left next to the trash can. And then we go to the opening credits. By the way, the crayon drawing's not very good. I don't think that one's getting on the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's terrible. <laughs> I've seen her finger paintings before. They're nothing to write home about. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when we come back from the opening credits, we're at the precinct, and the entire team, not just the B team, the duo, and the ladies, the entire office, she's there. She's just, she's the serial killer that they're all going to try and catch. He is called. That's the name that they came up with for her. And Dad says no days off and full forces on the case where everyone is going to go investigate this and keep working the prostitute angle, which I don't think And the uh, hookers. The hookers are pissed. <laughs> you know, they're like, it's affecting business. Yes. It you is, know? Because the police which are I do want to take, like I do want to take a minute and say I'm very happy that the hookers are back. And so we're stopped. No more of this getting into homicide stuff and <laughs> Mm. Other division. We're back to hooker crime. <laughs> the convention is over. Everyone's back on the street. They're out. Yes. You know, doing like we're back to regular Miami. Maybe next week we'll even get a drug deal. <laughs> the police and the vice team are out doing sweeps on the street, and there's a great conversation between Crockett and like one of the prostitutes that he knows, where he's asking her. And it's the conversation that you're talking about, John. He's talking to her, and she's like, the girls aren't working on the street because they're afraid of the murders. There's kids that aren't going to eat tonight. And then at the end of the co conversation, Crockett's like, thanks, Toots, and slaps her on the ass. Yeah, I was like, what the <laughs> hell, Crockett? <laughs> Did you even pay her for that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Tubbs, he's found Jackie, our killer. That's So her name is Jackie. And he's asking her some questions, and she's laying it on thick for him grew up in an orphanage this isn't what i i do and so tubbs gives her a number to call to find a better job tubbs As begs her to take his number like please please take my number <laughs> pam greer is not calling me back anymore no <laughs> yeah can't remember if she lives in chicago or new york <laughs> so confusing so she leaves and crockett comes over Tubbs is calling her a kid. She's only 18. He can't believe that people of that age are working the street. And Crockett drops a great line. He says, quote, pal of mine, we get older every year. Not yeah, that's how aging works. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, Jackie, played by musical artist Fiona, who was actually 24 at the time. She released four solo albums between 85 and 92. Appeared in the music video Cherry Pie, her only other film crit credit is the movie The Doors with Vice's favorite guest star Michael Madsen and <laughs> Billy Idol. What a weird weird combination. How would Billy Idol ever make it into a movie other than what his role was in The Wedding Singer which is like just to and be with, a prop. And with Michael Madsen mm -hmm. I mean. Mr. Personality. I don't know. Hey, you I might Michael just Madsen have to watch alone. <laughs> Michael Madsen is a gem, okay? <laughs> when he is sober, but <laughs> I listen to some of Fiona's music. It's very much like she's trying to be Stevie Nicks. 
it's almost like I expect the songs that she's singing to be covers of, of Stevie Nicks songs. Strangely enough, for a portion of time, she was married to Stevie Nicks' producer. <laughs> so that's why that happened. <laughs> Here, wear this wig. Wear this jacket with she all also- these frills on them. <laughs> one of the members of Wing- Winger was also played on some of her music, who was also managed by her husband. I think it was Winger. It's Kip Winger, I think. It is, yeah, it was yeah. Kip Winger. So I don't want to call him out if he doesn't want to be associated with it. <laughs> I don't need to get sued here. <laughs> Trudy comes over and as the duo are talking. She's She says she's going to go back to the precinct to do some more background checks. Tubbs is like, hey, baby, you want to go take care of this while you're there? And hands him ja- Jackie's information. And Trudy's, Trudy gives a little lip back, like, you know, I'm not your secretary. And Tubbs says, quote, I think those clothes are going to your head. He said, will you do this for me? She was like, what are you going to do for me? Like, And I think that's what he meant. Like, the, are those clothes getting to you? So are you acting like a hooker? Like, she's mm-hmm. saying, like, hey, what are you going to pay me? Are you going to pay me to do this? <laughs> See, I totally interpreted it as, like, Tubbs was saying, you work for me kind of deal. Yeah, I just interpreted her as saying, like, she wanted to get paid for it. What are you going to do for me for it? <laughs> I don't know. I got the feeling in this episode that Tubbs is in that dad kind of mind. Like, he's a strict father. And so I think he said it more as, I guess, her pimp. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, exactly. Or... Her daddy, I guess, is what they would say on the street. <laughs> is that the term? Is that the term they use on the street now? <laughs> Trying to be correct here. When we leave from the crime scene, we have a brief stop over at Cat's apartment. Cat is the man that was in the that's in the stage performance and is Jackie's boyfriend. Cat Cat just gets crushed here. I'm gonna kind of breeze through it really fast, but he's saying, "Let's get out of here." He knows that. She's killing people. She's like, let's get, he's like, let's get out of here. Let's get married. He shows her a ring. And she's like, nah, I don't know. I kind of like it here. Like, what's going on? So I'll pass. <laughs> that's yeah, the that's the, the gist scene. of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Back that night on the street, we see Gina. She makes a call to Crockett from a payphone. So she, and, and says that he needs to come down and come talk to this lady that she's got. So Tubbs and Crockett both come down. And they got this bag lady who lives on the street who is she's like partly there i guess because she says that she remembers seeing cat go over to the hotel she says that he's blonde but then also recognizes him on the street later and says that he came right through her living room yeah i think she's like i want to point later. out <laughs> that she has at, so when they first start talking to her she's ruffling rustling through her bag and you see the toilet brush in the bag <laughs> and then when she spots the guy who who dropped the crayon drawing, she's pointing at him with the toilet brush. Like, he's over there. So she has the toilet brush, but no toilet. <laughs> yes. What does she do yes. with that brush? In Crockett That's a point is... brush. <laughs> and Crockett is just smoozing her. He's so charming. <laughs> He can charm anybody, uh, even old, crazy ladies on the street. <laughs> and, and she does give a lot of information. So she saw this guy, went over to the hotel. He dropped this drawing. It's one of the crayon drawings. Meanwhile, Tub sees Jackie with a, with a sorry, John, you're set up. You're just uh, the unfortunate in this episode that we got, our, that there's you. And then there's all these Johns in the episode. <laughs> yes. Too. John, John, John. Yes. <laughs> Yes, and more Johns in music, So, but we'll come to that later. <laughs> Tubbs sees Jackie with a John going across the street to the hotel, so Tubbs takes off after her. Crockett goes and gets some beer for the lady as payment for all the information that she gave him. And Gina's like, hey, how come you never buy me beers? And he's like, you never asked. So yeah, both like, oh. the ladies uh-huh. get, uh, get, get kind of knocked around a little bit in this episode. Get slighted <laughs> by the men. Just put it back in their place. You need to get back out there on the corner. <laughs> Across the street at the hotel, Tubbs comes in and crashes the sex party. He knocks on the door. It's like, it's Tubbs. And she's like, Officer Tubbs? And then the guy that she's with comes out like, I don't know. This is nothing. I got to go. I don't know why. Who are you? Who is this? Where am I? <laughs> I have amnesia. <laughs> Dude, Tubbs just totally, to- totally cost Jim. Like twenty bucks right there. <laughs> and he also, also just blocked that guy stuff. right out too. <laughs> that guy thought he was going to have a fun time. Nope. Across the street, Tubbs is dropping off that beer, and the lady points out 
Cat as he's walking over to the hotel as well. So t- so Crockett takes off after him upstairs. Tubbs is talking to Jackie, saying, "You don't have to do this." She's trying to sleep with him, so thinking that if she sleeps with him, she'll get out of trouble. But he's not there to arrest her. He just says that you can do better. He's like taking it personal that she's a prostitute, right? He's not there to do his job. He's just there to be a social worker, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> He's like her big sister. You don't have to do this stuff. Just come home with me. <laughs> well, what's great is that he just prevented a murder, and he's just fallen for her stuff, hook, line, and sinker. Like, no oh, yeah. one throughout this episode really gets the point that this chick is completely off, off her rocker. Yeah. Yeah. Like, never, no one no one catches on that she's completely crazy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Cat comes upstairs, and he sees her with Tubbs, and he's immediately jealous. So that's a problem for him throughout the entire episode, right? He takes a swing at Tubbs. Crockett comes running up right there, and they place Cat under arrest and haul him down to the precinct. Tubbs got pre- a little aggressive with him, too, man. I thought Tubbs be- beat him down. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, Tubbs is taking this really, really personally. And so, and in the beginning, he thinks it's Cat that's doing the murders. So there's kind of a d- double-edged sword for him, right? He feels bad for Jackie, but then also wants to bring down Cat. But, I don't know. He's fallen into the Crockett trap. Yeah, the one you guys are always is, talking about what's funny. stupid. <laughs> yeah, he is, which is what what's funny is that they go into the interrogation and in this next scene, and Tubbs goes storming out. And you really get this where Sonny actually starts to kind of feel sorry for Cat. He starts to believe Cat. Because in the interrogation, Tubbs gets a little too aggressive. He leaves and... Cat starts to give Crockett his backstory that he saved her from a snuff film. He's in love with her. He's he he saved her, so he's trying to take take care of her. Outside of the room, Trudy has some information about Jackie. Goes to talk to Tubbs while he's on the phone. She's a runaway. Grew up in foster in, in an orphanage. Bounced around from foster home to foster home. But what, what's the most important for me out of this is that. She says, like, hey, so what's this info? Is this, is this information worth a thank you? How about dinner and wine? And Chubbs is like, yeah, 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 whatever. Just leave it on the desk. Yeah, he's <laughs> jerk to her. And she's like, and then she gets bitter. What is, what's the deal with this girl anyway? What's your deal? Why do you care so much? <laughs> yeah, she's like super disappointed in how he reacts. Because he's been treated like he's been a jerk this whole time to her, especially because he's an idiot. You know what? We don't see what goes on behind the scenes. Maybe Tubbs tired of them making jokes about how sweaty he is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean maybe Tubbs is tired of having them do all the work for him? Because I don't think I told Dominic. Everyone I don't makes think he- fun of me for that time. Am I saying it karaoke? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the guys know where downtown is, like where they need to go. Because he asked her, like, when you go downtown, can you do this? Like, do you not know how to get downtown? Do you not know where downtown is? Why do I have to do your job for you? Like, get in your your convertible and drive your ass downtown by yourself. <laughs> well, yeah, and when he hangs up the phone, Trudy stays there the whole time during the phone call. He hangs up the phone. He's like, yeah, thanks. And she's like, yeah, fine. Things are going to be uncomfortable around He's the office pay for, for a while. That one later. Right? <laughs> yeah. Crockett comes so we, out of the we room. get our yeah, Crockett comes out and we get our brief Castillo moment, you know, the do your social work outside. <laughs> Zing. Yeah. They're escorting Cat out and Jackie comes in. Tub sees Jackie goes to talk to her, hands her a key to the safe house, which is very important later. Yes. Cat sees him, mm-hmm. Amelia gets jealous again. They they give him the bums rush out the door into the alley. And then he goes into a meeting with Castillo. And Castillo's like, you're working the case. Keep following Cat and do your social work on your own time, Tubbs. But clearly Tubbs doesn't listen. No. So maybe sometimes they should listen to Dad. Because sometimes Dad knows what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and at this Dad point- doesn't actually want to be boss. I am now, I figured it out. Castillo doesn't want to be the boss. So he's just going to make the statement, and then he's not going to do anything about it. They're just going to go off and do whatever they want to do. So he but did he his said union it. required amount of work. Hey, maybe he thinks exactly. they should be, they exactly. should be adults by now, and he shouldn't have to babysit them. Just do your freaking job already, you two. <laughs> he's too busy slicing fools in half with katanas and shit. He can't be yeah. followed up on your case. <laughs> yeah, he don't care about you. Uh, he needs to go home and run around in his pajamas with a samurai sword. <laughs> can you imagine, like, like if they're all working in the office, and all, and all they hear is Castile in the office. <laughs> <laughs> 
whooshing noises from like a sword <laughs> and once in a while a loud thump. <laughs> There's no sword. It's just him making the whooshing noises. <laughs> whoosh, whoosh. <laughs> so when we leave from the precincts, we go back to Sex World. <laughs> Your favorite place. <laughs> The if, duo's back. if you're investigating a sex club, you you might as well enjoy it, you know? <laughs> the duo goes back over to the club to go check up on Kat. There's, Kat has to go back on stage. He's doing a show, but without Jackie. He's handcuffed to the bed. He sees Tubbs out in the audience, and he's like, I'll get you, punk. But I'm handcuffed to this bed <laughs> while this woman walks around me pretending to whip me. Good thing I'm a performer. I'm an, I'm an actor. He's a professional, okay? <laughs> he has to take his whippings, and then he will go after Tubbs. <laughs> on the street, Jackie's walking on the street, and a man pulls up and offers her a, a hundred bucks to uh, to go for a ride. Okay, but how I did love he the know she was Jack a hooker? Flash reference. How did he know she was a hooker, though? Really, she didn't look like a hooker. I mean, she just looked like a girl walking down the street. How did he know? In in my experience in playing Grand Theft Auto in my oh, I was gonna say, wait a second, if your experience is getting hookers, you know what they look like? Is that, is that where you're going? I was gonna say we're great. we might have to have a, a sidebar on this one. <laughs> I mean, I know this is a, a show and we must go on, but I need I need some explanation first. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how he can touch. We're just assuming that it's Miami and any woman on the street after 10 p.m. is a hooker. Apparently. That's exactly <laughs> what these Johns are doing. <laughs> <laughs> so in this scene where they're going back between Sex World and the car, Jackie gets pick, picked up by the John. She, you, you see that she has killed him in the car and then is lighting the car on fire. And then she leaves and randomly... the. E team shows up, not even in the bug van, in some other van. Yeah, it's a it's surveillance like, van. That's what that. Hey, is. <laughs> there's a man in that car. They go running over, and the car blows up. How convenient that Zito and Switex show up. Even Vice Jesus couldn't stop it. I mean, you would think that would be a good thing that they showed up there because Vice Jesus would be able to do something. But he's got he doesn't have the beard, so you couldn't do anything about it. No, no. <laughs> That's what they do in their spare um, time. They drive around looking for cars on fire. They just drive around. <laughs> <laughs> just driving around. <laughs> Look, no, there's another know, one, I Larry. Think, I think that they are required by contract to have something explode every episode. So this yeah. was like... All right, we need to blow up a car now. <laughs> and also, how could you see in that car? It was on fire. You couldn't see a body in there. Yeah, and they looked at it. They're like, there's somebody in there. Like, really? In that they ball saw of flame? someone was in there from like nine miles away. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> and then they pretended to run over there. after, like <laughs> Before it exploded, they like, kind of went a little closer. Like, we're not really going to go over there and do anything, but we're going to look. <laughs> In Switex defense, he can't run in those pants. <laughs> They're just too tight. He can't uh, run in those pants. They don't leave any room or imagination either. <laughs> Luckily, a crayon drawing survived the explosion. So later, he seems able to show that Tubbs and Crockett. So that rules out Cat because they were at the they were at Sex World. When this happened, so the rules out cat, he is not the murderer. So now we actually get some very Later impressive the police house. work where they start tracking all crayon sales in the city. And after <laughs> accidentally kicking the doors down of a few kindergartens, they find Jack. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I, that was in my head. That's what I wanted to happen. I think you just started to lay out the plot of Kindergarten Cop. You know, I, I was starting to, start to head that direction. So, All right. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Let's, let, uh, I think we were somewhere around the walking montage. <laughs> we're almost there. At the safe house, Tubbs shows up. Jackie is there. She did what Tubbs asked her to do. There's like an indoor pool, multi-story with an indoor pool. What the hell kind of safe house is on the vice payroll here? Well, I mean, I think it's supposed to be they use it for drugs, that, like when they're doing undercover. They can't be in like a regular house. I mean, you can't be a drug dealer and have an outdoor pool. That doesn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> they have a brief conversation about her growing up in the orphanage. And she says, and this is what's hooking Tubbs. That she wasn't good enough to be loved. And so she's got him. She's got him hooked. Or at least she 
she thinks she does, that she that she can permanently move into the safe house at least. So when Tubbs leaves from the safe house, they go over we go over to the precinct and what's gonna happen is that Tubbs and Crockett are gonna stay up all night studying the Cran killers, all the notes from the Cran killer cases, and then try and find a motive. Over at Katz, he wakes up and finally puts it together that Jackie's not there. So I mean he last time he saw her, he was getting released from jail. Then he just wakes up like two days later and realizes that his girlfriend hasn't come home yet. Yeah, I know that's kind of weird, right? <laughs> like, at what point did you know yeah, she was gone? A long night handcuffed to a chair. Yeah, that probably takes it right out of him too. <laughs> like, I'm sure after you're handcuffed for two hours to a chair and some girl pretends to whip you, you just come home and take a solid nap. Like you go right to bed. <laughs> yeah. So of course, you know, he wakes up, wants to know where Jackie's at. So he starts walking, and he's walking, and then he's running, and he's still walking. <laughs> he's walking the music now. Stop to buy some vents. Walking, walking montage. All those vents that just happen to vent like right by his head. I know he's very unlucky in that aspect. Everywhere he stopped, stuff was Luckily. venting out. Of- him. I love the Stella moment. Yeah, he stopped yelling, yelling her name. Into I the love night. you. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. That's why I think this director really wanted to make music videos. The next morning, the duo wake up. I just want to point this out real fast. They wake up after looking at all their paperwork. Or they're not wake up, but they're like just barely staying awake. Oh, and yeah. Crockett's like, hey, you want to go have some on the couch? And I'm just like, guys, just go so you already. Like, there, dude, there's you caught that also. too. <laughs> yeah, I was like, dude, Crockett just asked Tubbs to cuddle. <laughs> yeah, I need a cuddle today. <laughs> nice, good cuddle. Then we'll be back to the police work. <laughs> Over at Cats, Jackie finally showed up, and Cats like, hey, cool. Like, like she's packing up, and he's not asking her anything. We don't hear him ask her anything about where were you last night, where have you been for the last four days, who you've been talking to, how come you haven't showed up to work. There's none of that. She's just packing up and Kat saying he's warning her about they're going to get you, you. they'll hurt you. (laughs) In the end, she just says she's sorry and she's leaving anyway. Like, see ya, bitch. Over at the precinct, Tubbs gets some nice pretty flowers and a nice big case. He's, He's going to prom, guys. He got yep. a he he got officially invited <laughs> uh-huh. now. He's going to prom. <laughs> <laughs> he was waiting for this day for so long, and it finally came. Hey, you Pam Brew never gave him any flowers. <laughs> Pam never gave him any flowers. And it it had to be something to him because it makes him just go running. Uh, it worked. Yeah. What was on that card? What did she say? Like yeah. I'm naked or something? Like I'm waiting for you. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> he goes running right out and says, "I have to go take care of something." And cry Marcus should be thinking, like, this all sounds really familiar. Like, I've I've done this before. I did this just a few weeks ago. (laughs) Yeah, and I rolled around in the dirt last week. (laughs) Crockett does get a call from Kat, though, where Kat says he's going to give him a deal of a lifetime. He's going to tell him exactly who the killer is. All you have to do is come meet me in this dark alley behind this old hotel. Just, just close me, your eyes okay. and open and your idiot. mouth. <laughs> <laughs> just close your eyes and open your mouth and wait for the hose. <laughs> <laughs> like an idiot. He's like, yeah, sure. I'll go by myself to this dark alley on the bad side of town behind this abandoned hotel. See you there, cat. Yeah, exactly. oh, sorry for that investigation for murder stuff. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. Well, Crockett and Cat are buddies now. <laughs> Over at the safe house, Jackie is waiting for Tubbs, and this is where we put we put it together. Jackie is convinced that Tubbs is riding in on his white horse. He's on his shining armor. He's going to rescue her. She's going to be able to live in this beautiful safe house with Tubbs. Tubbs is going to take care of her, and Tubbs is like, "Oh, this." This escalated quickly. I'm trying to get you a job and get you well, out no, of my I house. Think, I think <laughs> I think they're both delusional because I think she's like, Tubbs is going to love me and take care of me. And Tubbs is like, I'm going to be your dad. You better finish that sandwich. Do your homework. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't drink your milk today, did you? No, nope, you didn't. He's drink drawing up adoption papers. <laughs> Yeah, he's like trying to get her into what he's trying to do is get her into halfway house or something or like a like some kind of program where they're going to help her get a job. That's what he's that's what he was trying to do all this time. Talking on the phone secretly mm-hmm. was he was like, he was arranging that and she thinks mm-hmm. he wants to like have sex with her or something. He's in love with her. Yeah. Not that he would ever give her take a couple of days off. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Tub says that he's going to take a couple of days off 
too and help her go find some places to live and, and find some work. And I'm like, wait a minute, didn't dad say no taking vacation while we're investigating this case? And he didn't listen. He defiant. Tough. <laughs> <laughs> Jackie turns it up and says, kiss me. I love you. And he says, I love you too. I'm like, whoa. Huh? What? But as a friend. But, yeah. so why would he so, say yeah. that to her, though? He knows she's like the I don't know, but about to get sweaty in here. <laughs> Please, dear God, don't get sweaty up in here. <laughs> you have to be, like, in the right frame of mind to expect that. And if that would have been not good. That would have been a shock to see him sweaty with his ankles up in the air again. <laughs> Tubbs is trying to beat Dr. Huxtable. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> don't eat the pudding and that is creepy on more levels than one <laughs> don't eat the pudding <laughs> that's how we get you with those damn pudding pops <laughs> I never thought how much Jello is probably suffering no right now yeah I know <laughs> Dubs goes into this long explanation like do you know what a friend is and you just see Jackie look on her face like she's getting stabby <laughs> I need to make a crayon drawing right now, really bad. <laughs> Dude, I was waiting for. I, I was thinking in my head, like, I bet you Tubbs seems leaning. I bet you Tubbs seems lean on me to to hookers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Over at the Ardmore Hotel, Croc is going to meet up with Cat, like an idiot he is, and Cat, like Spider Man's out of in a the vent most discreet and holds white nice suit. Point. <laughs> so, in the most discreet white suit and white shoe combo you have ever seen <laughs> no one's ever gonna see well, cop, luckily, Crockett a cop car no not in that dark alley she has nothing going on down there except for that guy in that white suit <laughs> luckily a cop car pulls up while cat is asking crockett where jackie is and crockett is able to kick cat away but cat runs off and the police officer as he should holds crockett there at gunpoint even though crockett's yelling that he's a cop because how do you prove that crockett how do you prove it back at the safe house jackie's setting up some roofy coladas for her and tubs <laughs> A little bit for you, a little bit for me, more for you. She brings up his nightly apple juice. Tubbs ain't having it. And Tubbs is gonna like, roofie him. <laughs> I think we need to address Tubbs why he drinks Tubbs the juice. Like, <laughs> Go ahead, Tubbs isn't having it. Tubbs is like, it's bedtime, young lady. Uh, get in there and say your prayers. Yeah, he tells her to say her prayers. <laughs> Can we address the sleeping situation? Like, why is he sleeping in a bed in the middle of the living room, and then she's sleeping on a couch in the in the family room? What is going on with that? Why is that bed in the middle of that living room? Isn't there a bedroom? Like, and I'm pretty sure it's in the same room where the pool is. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like all I one room. I think it's the same room where where the pool is. Yeah. <laughs> you sleep walking and where do the stairs go, pool? Melissa? Hmm? Then where do the stairs go, Melissa? Where do those stairs go then? What's upstairs? I don't know. They go to nothing. It's like a false stair. I don't know. But that's what I'm saying. It's like the weirdest sleeping situation. That's all. That's where you keep your white suits. It's like in The Sims where you have a bunch of money and you build downstairs and you run out of money, but you already put the stairs down? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Just half a bathroom. Well, he's a good boy. He drinks all of his apple juice before bed, so he's gonna he's gonna sleep good tonight. Over at Cat's house, Crockett is now trying to run down wherever Cat is. He comes busting into the house, and Melissa, you you caught some interesting designs on the carpet inside of the house. Um, yeah. Why was there sperm on the on the carpet in the de- in the designs? <laughs> it looked like a sperm. The Not hell? as in like. You know, no, wet no, no. spots on the floor. No, no, no. Like, no, no like it, if you were to actually draw a, a sperm. sperm. Like an individual <laughs> sperm. Like with this squiggly little tail. <laughs> See, uh, I was already getting ready to make another semen joke. Well, there you go. <laughs> 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 Set it up for you. <laughs> Crockett looks around the house and he sees a whole bunch of crayon drawings all over the wall. <laughs> and he finally puts it together. If it's not Cat, because he was doing his sex acting job when the last murder happened, then it must be the person who did the crayon drawing still, which means that it must be Jackie. Oh, shit, I got to go save Tubbs. So he goes running out, jumps in the Ferrari, and drives away. Meanwhile, Cat was at the at his place. He sees Crockett drive away. He jumps on his motorcycle and follows Crockett over to the safe house. 
And this is where we go to the final scene of the episode. Jackie gets up and she comes over to see Stubbs, make sure he's fully roofied. And he's out. He hasn't moved since since he finished off his apple juice. So she handcuffs him to the bed. And she handcuffs him to, to, to the bed. Takes his gun. And like an idiot, Tubbs, yeah, Tubbs still has his gun on his hip in the holster. Maybe he thought he was going to need it. So it was like right next to him. Maybe he had some kind of premonition that she was going to try and like attack him in his sleep or something. She was going to try and have her way with him. <laughs> well, she takes his gun, takes the phone off the hook. So Crockett's racing over to the safe house. He can't get a hold of Tubbs. So he calls in the he calls a precinct that says send every officer over to the safe house on 95th the one Sorry, with the stairs they're going nowhere lost, i'm getting that lost one. in my notes <laughs> also why does um Crockett Crock keep has- hanging on to the hanging on to the phone when it's like a busy signal what does he think's gonna happen he's like for like 10 <laughs> minutes he's got the, <laughs> the busy signal <laughs> busy hang it up <laughs> inside jackie has laid out some of her crayon drawings she's burning them she's standing over tubs in a robe he finally wakes up and sees her and as crockett comes up to the door starts banging on the door he yells out to crockett shoot the lock she's got you know basically i'm in danger Crockett shoot the lock come busting in here cat comes flying up on his motorcycle and just rams the door with his motorcycle and then but inside we see Jackie she's pulled the gun and I'm thinking this is it she's gonna try and shoot Tubbs will Tubbs make it out of here or will Crockett have to shoot and kill Jackie instead in a huge twist Jackie says I don't want to hurt you Tubbs turns the gun on herself and commits suicide. Crockett runs in and sees it with a shocked look on his face. We have a freeze frame, and that's the end of the episode. It makes no sense. It makes no (laughs) sense the Black Widow serial killer would turn the gun on herself. I didn't see it coming, uh, especially with the motorcycle angle. I thought once the motorcycle went through the door, like, like it's going to be, you know, Crockett rolls in and shoots her before she can kill Tubbs, you know, but then she shoots herself it's like ah episode over Melissa you were saying what's the point with Cat and the motorcycle yeah that's what I was talking about why did he they even need him to him following Crockett meant nothing <laughs> like okay he didn't do anything but he I just, guess they needed him to take down that door he just his body to bust down the door <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they, I mean, they needed Crockett would have never got in there if it hadn't been for him. But you know, but, it, it, but nothing. He wouldn't he have gotten in there too late. That's what I say. He would have got in there too late. <laughs> but can you imagine being Crockett and walking in and seeing that like tub like chained up and then <laughs> and then her naked? Like, whoa! What the hell? This is some BDSM that went sideways. Someone <laughs> didn't know the right safe word. <laughs> he has to go over to Tubbs and be like, "Did she touch you? Are you okay? Like, what happened before she shot herself? <laughs> show, show me, show on, me the on the doll, doll where, she where she touched you." you. <laughs> oh my god, you guys just said the same joke. <laughs> well, let's go over and talk about the music because this was basically a music video and also an extended music video for Ted Nugent. So let's go over and break down this week's music. All right, John. We have some some big name musicians in this episode, including a song that has played, I think, twice, if not more than that, throughout the episode. You know, by the end of the episode, it felt like five or seven or ten times that they played that song. <laughs> so, but the song you are referring to is "Little Miss Dangerous" by Ted Nugent. We already talked about Ted Nugent a few episodes back when we had him come through here. So I thought, what new can I talk about? Well, let's talk about the album. Well, the album's name is "Little Miss Dangerous," which is the same as the name of the episode, which I guess is cool. The only time it ever happened in the series. <laughs> They even made a little promotional video for the song when the episode aired. The song, by the way, did not chart, but at the time, because it was featured on Miami Vice, it was considered one of his biggest successes at the time. What's interesting is that the episode that Ted Nugent was in was essentially this episode, but for Crockett. He was falling for a woman who was a prostitute who worked with a man. To, and, but in that case, they were killing people and, and stealing their money for drugs. And this one, Cat and Jack are just killers. It's interesting that his music is in this one. That's basically the exact same episode 
episode that Ted Nugent was in. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm pretty much doing Ted Nugent twice for the same music video. So, I was looking on the personnel listed on the album, and there are only two band members listed on the album, Ted Nugent and a guy named Dave Amato. Dave Amato, best known as the current lead guitarist of REO Speedwagon. He joined REO Speedwagon in May of 1989 when Gary Richraft left. I decided, let's talk about Dave here. Dave was bounced around between bands before finding his way to L.A. He did sessions with LaToya Jackson, which, I mean, probably didn't help his career much. I mean, that's like <laughs> it's like someone now saying like they played drums on a Hannah Montana song. Who cares? <laughs> so, but he also did backing vocals for David Lee Roth, Rick Springfield, and Motley Crue. That actually probably got him uh, eventually... In 1985, Amato took vocal and guitar responsibilities with Nugent, in which he would help create this album and the next album, before he would leave Nugent in 1988 due to conflicts in scheduling or writing on the wall, becoming Oreo Speedwagon's lead singer. Hmm. So, the next... The next song we have is Here Comes My Girl by Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. And I love Tom Petty. Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, a rock band from Gainesville, Florida. <clears throat> they debuted in 1976. A few fun facts. They're most, well, they're most known, uh, they're known for, obviously, Tom Petty's known for the songs American Girl, Breakdown. Last Dance with Mary Jane. But a few things you might not have known about Petty is that Petty's early bands were the Sundowners, the Epics, and my favorite, Mud Crunch. I know, so. John, you are a huge, huge Tom Petty fans you keep it in first gear not just spending the next 10 minutes gushing exactly exactly i could talk a ton about tom petty but i'm trying to keep this about tom petty and the heartbreakers mud clutch also featuring two other future band members in mike campbell the, on guitars and ben montench on keyboard the other members being ron blair on bass and Steve, stan lynch on drums ron blair would eventually in 1981 be replaced by Howie Epstein until Epstein would die of a drug overdose in 2002-2003. Back to little things you might not know about Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. When they first came out as Mud Crutch, they weren't very popular in the U.S. They actually made, struck it big in the U.K. first. And after they blew up in, in England, it was their success in England that, that brought them success in the U.S. A few other things. Petty uh, was often known for uh, butting heads with record executives, including taking a stand when they wanted to charge $10 for their new record rather than the eight ninety five they charged previously. Interesting that he would fight over that. Yeah, over a dollar. Over a dollar. Something else you might not know, and I thought, that, and I think this is incredibly interesting, that in 1994, band's drummer Stan Lynch left the band and was temporarily replaced by David Grohl. Yeah, Dave Grohl of the Foo Fighters. Yeah, of Nirvana. Yeah. Uh, of yeah. Nirvana. Notice how I said in 1994, Kurt Cobain died in April of 94. Uh, uh, shortly after Nirvana uh, ended, Dave Grohl played drums for Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. They even did an episode of SNL. Wow. Yeah. So eventually the band would find replacement in Steve Ferroni. So and Dave <laughs> Grohl would go, to, go on <laughs> to start the Foo Fighters. So... I could talk about Tom Petty all day, but let's get to our next song, Assault and Battery by Howard Jones. Howard Jones is a English singer-songwriter who had 10 top 40 hits in the UK between 1983 and 1986, including six top 10. Howard Jones is the eldest of four boys, all musicians. Brother Roy released several dubstep albums under the name <laughs> Dreadzilla. So... I wanted to make sure I threw that in there. I wanted to throw in the dubstep albums. <laughs> um, so Howard Jones is actually a, I am not going to pronounce this right, Nietzschean, Nietzschean Buddhist. Mm. He was converted after he met Bill Bryant, who he was introduced to by his brother Martin. Bill Bryant, I guess, was a, is a, I don't know. 
a uh, famous Buddhist, who I guess wrote some of, uh, he wrote a bunch of his songs from Howard Jones' first couple albums when he made it famous. So I guess that's what makes him famous. The only other thing I really want to point out about this Howard Jones guy, so obviously he was popular in the mid-80s, right around this time. He used to appear as a solo artist at local venues in Highcombe, where he, where he was living in England. He would hire mime Jed Hoyle and per- the mime would perform improvised choreo- cho- uh, choreographed <laughs> dance while doused in white paint to Jones music. You had me at mime. Mime like, dance? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I guess everybody's got a stick. His was painting Wimes might and, uh, white and making them dance while he played music. <laughs> the other thing I want to point out is that in 1985, his single, No One Is to Blame, was re-recorded with Phil Collins on drums, and Phil Collins produced it. And Phil the Collins hell? was the backup vocals. What the yeah, I know. Phil Collins is fairly involved in everything in the fucking 80s. Yeah, I know. Dude, I'm everywhere. I'm convinced, yeah, dude, I am convinced that Phil Collins is stalking Jan Hammer. He is leaving long messages <laughs> on Jan Hammer's answering machine about music that he should <laughs> include in the show. So let's get to the last song. Order of Death by Public Image LTD. Public Image Limited is an English punk band formed by singer John Johnny Linden, a.k.a. Johnny Rotten. Ah. Johnny Rotten, former band member of the Sex Sex Pistols. So after the Sex Pistols broke up, he formed Public Image. And that's pretty much what he did all the way until now. The story of how he formed them is kind of funny. Just follow me on this. In 1978, after break, after leaving the Sex Pistols, Linden traveled to Jamaica with Virgin Records owner Richard Branson. Richard okay. Branson was in Jamaica scouting emerging reggae artists, but Branson also had flown American band Devo to Jamaica, hoping that he could convince Devo to make Lyndon their new lead singer. Devo, on a side note, said no. <laughs> of course they did. <laughs> <laughs> yes. After their romp in Jamaica, Lyndon got, gets back to England. He hooks up with longtime friend John Wardle, K.A. Ja Wobble. I'm sorry, John War- Wardle. I did say John. There's so many Johns. I just. <laughs> oh, ja, A.K.A. Ja Wobble. They would recruit Clash guitarist Keith Levine. And then they would put an ad out into a paper, the Melody Maker, and they would hire some Canadian steward, a uh, student <laughs> who just applied to play drum. <laughs> so that doesn't matter. Essentially, the band's makeup has changed consistently over the years with band members leaving. The only person that stayed the same is Johnny Rotten. That was a weird mix of people on that airplane, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Devo, Richard Branson, and Johnny Rotten on, yeah. on an airplane. Like that, that seems like a setup to a joke. <laughs> Funny story, in preparation for their first album, Public Image spent all their money before they actually recorded it. <laughs> <laughs> so then they didn't have any money. So they spent, after, because they spent out their entire budget, they basically very quickly recorded eight tracks of varying quality. <laughs> um, during which of the recording of these eight tracks, Wobble beat up producer Bill Price's assistant engineer. Damn. Um, yeah. Hardcore, man. This is punk. <laughs> and people loved it. And people just loved the album. People loved it so much that in May 1980, believe it or not, Dick Clark invited them on American Bandstand. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. So, pretty much in 81, Wobble left. And in 83, Levine left. In 93, they eventually took a hiatus. And then they got back together with all new people in the 2000s because Johnny Rott needs to make more money. And what's funny, so, okay, uh, no joke. Now, uh, I'm only including this. I don't know if I necessarily believe it, but <clears throat> there is a part where it talks about when the drummer left. They didn't... No, it was Wobble. When Don Wobble left in 81, they didn't really replace him with another bassist. Just no and more so, bass. No more bass in yeah. their music. <laughs> Just no more bass. <laughs> And so, Tommy Rotten's idea to 
to cur- to fix this in the record to make up for this was to have the drummer play like a marching band style. <laughs> okay, Bill Collins has said that this marching band style is some influenced the way he played drums in several tracks in the mid eighties. Hmm. I don't know if I believe it, but damn it, Phil. <laughs> Get out of my music! <laughs> Everywhere. Come on, man. Give me a music segment where you're not involved. <laughs> there we go. Once again, it's like proven that if you are somebody in the '80s, one you you or something you made ended up on Miami Vice, and two, Phil Collins was either a part of it. Or he eventually made his own version of it. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't get now why Genesis <laughs> hates him. <laughs> Let's go round up on this episode because I think we're in agreement that it's it, it's a good episode. We're seeing a trend with Miami Vice, and you know we're in the last like six episodes of the season. So let's go over and break. And let's give our final thoughts on this episode. All right, guys, I'll say that from my perspective, this was a good episode. When I heard the when I saw the words crayon killer in the description, I fully expected it to be like when you watch a current episode of CSI where they have the person who's like really crazy and like dresses up like a doll and lures people over to their house to kill them. But they actually did it pretty good. Like it fit more like what would be a realistic serial killer. Fiona was okay. Everyone did a good job. Like it was it was a good episode. The hook, the twist at the end is what got me. I was not ready at all for her to commit suicide at the end. And that's what really sealed the episode for me is that they totally shifted. I mean, it was it was on the edge anyway, right? It's on. It wasn't on cable. It's on regular TV. They're at Sex World. There's prostitution. And then there's suicide at the end. Like, man, Miami Vice really took it up a notch in this episode. They really like threw it in people's faces that were watching TV. I liked it. It was good. The hook got me real good at the end, so I have nothing to complain about with this episode. John, what are your final thoughts? We brought up Shamar Moore earlier, who is also <laughs> on Criminal Minds. Everything I learned from Criminal Minds says that a Black Widow-style serial killer would have probably killed Tubbs for turning her down. She wouldn't mm-hmm. have killed herself. That's just, <laughs> it's the wrong mentality. Everything I learned from Dexter, um, it, it all points me into saying that they just they got it wrong. <laughs> that aside, I I legitimately enjoyed the episode. I thought this was a fantastic episode. I thought it was funny seeing Tubbs and Crockett switch places as far as how I'm usually used to the dynamic where usually Sonny's running to the aid of some woman and now it's it, it's a Tubbs episode where he's he's fallen for the killer vixen. Mm-hmm. Um so I I think the only way I could have enjoyed the episode more is if Phil Collins would stay the hell out of my music <laughs> segment. Get out of I'm calling you out Phil. Get out of there. <laughs> you you get gotta- out of there. Just stop saying his name. Like, and then the drums were also done by. Yeah, just, just not yes. say his name. Just Don't skip mention. the name altogether. <laughs> yeah, I, I swear to God, if another Jenna, if if one of his songs appears, I'm just gonna start making up stuff. So be prepared, <laughs> Phil. I'm warning you. I also mentioned at the beginning that this this Black Widow, as you called it, John, this Black Widow style storyline, it's. Modern cop shows have beaten this storyline to death. Yes, they have. Like all over it, those it's, shows. <laughs> it's, they always bring up the same things, too. The fact that women are a lot, a lot less likely to be serial killers. And nine times out of ten, they kill using poison. So, like, half of the episodes are about poison poisoning mm-hmm. people and then the other half seemed to be about them getting stabby so apparently that's <laughs> like there's no poison around they're gonna get stabby <laughs> Melissa, what are your final thoughts on this episode i love this episode it's finally an episode where tubbs is an idiot <laughs> where tubbs is the idiot and you guys will leave poor crockett alone he just has a heart of gold tubbs is just an idiot <laughs> no i love this episode i think i disagree with john about one thing and i don't think she's a black widow type because like i mean i get it she does have sex with them and then she murders them but i think what they were trying to say with this is that she was like abused as a child and that's why they kept switching her from places to places and they kind of insinuated that early on 
saying like, oh, you know, that same old song and dance. Like she was, did they say why? Well, yeah, because, you know, like I think they were trying to say that she was abused. And so that's why she was killing people. Not she was just crazy. Anyway. And so I'm maybe just that's, saying, I know, in season I, I know. four, episode 21 of Criminal Minds. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I watch Criminal Minds too. And what I'm saying is that okay. she doesn't fit the profile. <laughs> that, that's well, what I'm saying. We'll continue the argument after this. <laughs> <laughs> I just want you two to admit that one day you were watching Soul Train. Both of you are watching the same episode in different places and went, who's that guy? Oh, and I then was went on. And then went on, on to go watch CSI. Yeah, no, CSI. Criminal Minds. Criminal Minds. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then, then went on to watch Criminal Minds, and now you find each other. <laughs> <laughs> Did you watch that episode of Soul Train? <laughs> uh, for the record, he's not on Criminal Minds anymore. He's got a new show coming out, and I will be watching that on CBS. <laughs> so, but you no. Know, anyways, I love the episode. Like I said, this was one of those episodes that was the reason why I was not allowed to watch Miami Vice when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I did still watch it, obviously. That's why I'm a super fan. But yeah, it was like edgy and very risque for them to do this. And then, and then the fact that she killed herself at the end when I, that's not what I thought was going to happen. So yeah, I have no complaints at all. Except for they were kind of mean to Trudy. <laughs> kind of being mean to Trudy. Which was <laughs> Poor uncalled Trudy. For. I know. <laughs> Poor Trudy. Doesn't get taken seriously anywhere. And she does all the yeah. work. Maybe the and people downtown the, treat her with, with, with respect. They do. They open the no, doors for her. No, because the guy everything. that used, the guy that used to open the door for her, he's gone. <laughs> yeah, he's dead. <laughs> well, that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to check out the website, go with the heat.com. We'd love to hear from you. What are your thoughts on this episode? Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com, or you can tweet at us. You can find all of our tw- Twitter accounts and the other ways to subscribe on the website, go with the heat.com. Just click on that about us section. You can find all the ways to get a hold of us. That's going to do it for us this week, and we'll see y'all next time. I'm warning you, Phil. Stay away. <laughs> <laughs>